I can say definitively that Dr. Cooley, Dr. Willerson, many of the luminaries that I had the privilege of knowing uh, over the course of my life would be thrilled to see this, absolutely thrilled. So to be a small part of this is uh, really an honor. Um, this will not be the most scientific presentation you've heard, but it may be one of the most passionate. Um, maybe it's gonna feel like a sermon a little bit. I kind of actually hope so. <clears throat> Expectation setting in pediatric heart surgery, pediatric perfusion is profoundly difficult. <clears throat> All you have to do is look at the published outcomes disparities. And you know, everyone here, <clears throat> we can take a moment at the Texas Heart Institute and pause and think about what's going on in our country and in our world in terms of healthcare disparities. It's an absolute abomination. You all know that over the last three years in the United States, life expectancy has gone down. That's in our country. Despite the fact that we spend 20% of our GDP on healthcare. We have serious problems and it's for serious people like you to take them on, but you can't take them on by diluting yourselves. You can't take on complex pediatric perfusion by diluting yourself. So anyway, <laughs> enough of that. Let's just give you uh, a rundown of what I um, think are some important, some important elements of this, especially, first of all, great colleagues. Um, Richard, Tiffany, Kellen, um, our tremendous colleagues, we've recently added. Doug and Madeline to our team in Austin. So we're five perfusionists uh, and we're really proud of our association with the perfusion school, Texas Heart Perfusion School, where we have uh, welcomed uh, you all and we'll continue to do so as long as you give us that privilege. Um, of course, we're here uh, in the house that Dr. Cooley built. And uh, the symbol of excellence is everywhere. It's all about excellence. But defining excellence is not so easy. And achieving it, how do you know that you've achieved excellence? How do you really know that you've achieved ex excellence? And then once you think you're there, how do you maintain it? Well, I would submit excellence is not a destination. It is a continuous journey and it can be painful and it can be unpopular, but this is not a popularity contest. We are here to work together for the benefit of our patients and their families. I also can't come to this institution and not think about our late departed friend, Dr. David Sugarbaker, um, who was a transformational thoracic surgeon, as you all probably know, some of you know. Uh, Dr. Sugarbaker was president of the American Association for Thoracic Surgery, which is pretty much the highest honor uh, in chest surgery. And in his presidential address, he had a slide that I plagiarized. Clarity of purpose, focused attention, the essence of excellence. So I made a copy of that. It's been on my bulletin board ever since, which is a lot of years. You see how prominent it is right next to picture of my family. I look at it every single morning because I believe that we have to touch base with who we are and what we are doing every single day. This is what we propose to do. We propose to take care of people's children. And when we become, become callous or rote or protocolized about that too much, we lose sight of what we're about. So how do we set expectations. So in, a medicine, in medicine now, of course, we talk about observed to expected outcomes. So what are our observed to expected outcomes in perfusion? How do we pick the cannulas? Do we use vacuum assistance? What's the prime look like? What device are we going to use and what vendor are we going to go with? Who's going to be on the team? What are we going to use for pH management? Are we going to use anti-grade cerebral perfusion? What are adequate flow rates? How do we assess that? What cardioplegia do we use? What mode do we deliver it? Do we use NEARS? Do we not? Blood pressure targets. How important is serum lactate? Vasodilator coordination. Modified 
ultrafiltration, zero balance ultrafiltration, continuous ultrafiltration, no ultrafiltration. How do we transition from ECMO? What VADs are available? And how do we make patients successful transplant candidates? That's what we do, right? Do we have answers to all of these? No, we do not. I'm lucky enough to have been in a lot of great places over the course of time. They all indelibly influenced me, University of Texas Medical Branch, Johns Hopkins, Cleveland Clinic, Texas Children's, and in the upper left quadrant of the screen, uh, Royal Children's in Melbourne. So be very careful about what you don't know. Be very careful about what you don't know. I highlighted that in red because as I was at a great place, this is the story Johns Hopkins Hospital. Kathy and I were colleagues. It's the story Johns Hopkins Hospital. And I was there for almost 10 years and I participated in a lot of heart surgery. In fact, that's where I learned to be a heart surgeon. And parenthetically, I put this as, in as a side, having a, an extracorporeal perfusion device to resuscitate heart lung blocks is not a new concept. This is what we were doing in the laboratory in the early 80s at Johns Hopkins. And it's wonderful that this is now coming to clinical fruition uh, to the benefit of our patients. Um, in that experience, we got to spend a lot of time in the research lab, and this is yours truly and one of our perfusionists, and so I learned a lot about the pump. In fact, I broke a lot of pumps, uh, and I made a lot of messes, and, but that was, a bit, that was actually a very uh, vital experience, and this is me in the operating room at Johns Hopkins, and this was probably about 1992. I thought I knew everything, I promise you. Uh, seldom wrong, never in doubt. That was our mantra. And what I believed about perfusion around that time was that every baby came out of the operating room cold and edematous and usually acidotic. The longer the operation, the poorer the outcome. Bleeding is an expectation in pediatric cardiac surgery. Speed is paramount. Accuracy, accuracy is desirable, but compromise for speed is acceptable. You can do it all. You can be a pediatric heart surgeon in the morning and an adult heart surgeon in the night. You can be a pediatric perfusionist on the weekend, but an adult perfusionist during the week. And that perfusionists are pretty much technicians. Um, you know, out of sight, out of mind, turn it on, put a little this in, pull that in, don't bother me during the operation. That's what I believed. What I know about pediatric perfusion in 2022 is that every baby should come out of the operating room, euvolemic, warm, well perfused, and with a closed chest. The lengthy operation has absolutely no bearing on outcomes. Bleeding should be extremely rare. Speed is irrelevant and often dangerous. Gentleness, accuracy, attention to detail are paramount and should never be compromised. Patients are individuals, therefore focused, refined circulatory support is mandatory. And the perfusionists are integral professional colleagues on our team. So what happened? What happened to me? Well, I got slapped up by the side of the head. So I drugged my poor family. And many of you have heard this story before, but you can't hear it enough. I drugged my family to Australia to a very meager hospital, Royal Children's Hospital, and thank Goodness, I was introduced to a tyrant, a brilliant tyrant, the sort of person that I would want operating on my children and now grandchildren, Roger Me. He is the most under-recognized surgeon of my lifetime. He should be lauded everywhere for what he has done in pediatric cardiac disease, but he's not. But fortunately, the country of Australia saw fit to honor him recently and he received the Order of Australia, which is essentially the same as being knighted. Uh, this is something under the official auspices of the Queen uh, of England. And so a very appropriate acknowledgement for Dr. Mee's contributions, <coughs> but he was a tough taskmaster. And this is where I learned that all those things that I thought were true at Johns Hopkins, <coughs> I needed to pitch them out and start over and I needed to meet people like Stephen Horton, who were intensely focused on 
precise physiologic perfusion of the children. And the results were shockingly different, not just a little different, shockingly different. And I could tell you exactly where I was and with whom when I said, I'm either going to do it this way or I'm not going to do it at all. And that continues to be uh, my uh, commitment. And I stole these slides. These are Melbourne slides, small body perfusion, not scaled down adults, accurate machinery, appropriate cannulas, customized perfusion, not new. Avoid rapid temperature changes, high flow, low pressure, systemic vasodilation, ultrafiltration cannula position, not new. Um, and by the way, they were prescient in their understanding of pH step management at that time. As an aside, hopefully someone in this meeting has talked about this, but this article uh, just came out last week in Journal of American College of Cardiology. It's very worth, well, <clears throat> well worth reading, written by um, a senior author, Jim Kirkland, The Origins and Evolution of Extracorporeal Circulation. It's a tremendous article. Of course, it's a, it's a viewpoint on the heritage the Texas Heart team might view it a little differently. And I, you know, I might suggest uh, that some of you all think about writing an editorial comment about this because it's a very interesting article about the de development of the subject. Now, I came to Houston in 1995, I was invited to build a new program. And we had a lot of things to take on that needed housekeep uh, housekeeping. And if this is making people a little uncomfortable, good. We should talk about that because this is the reality of expectation setting and the pursuit of excellence. There was a problem here. There was a problem with pediatric cardiac surgery and there was a problem with pediatric cardiac perfusion, undeniably. So what did we have to do? We had to build a team committed to the children and that required challenging titans, challenging titans of the industry to say, we need to go back to the basics of commitment. That included continuous rapid cycle quality improvement. We got the right people, we embraced them. We clearly articulated the expectations and we were and continue to be relentless about this. And that including taking uh, to task people like Dr. DeBakey. Do you think that wasn't difficult to talk to Dr. DeBakey about a different way of doing things in the Texas Medical Center? I can promise you it was. Dr. Cooley, do you think that wasn't difficult? I can promise you it was. Dr. Keats, difficult to tell them that we needed committed perfusionists, committed anesthesiologists, committed <clears throat> surgeons, committed ORs. Uh, but we got it done. This is Texas Children's at that time. Uh, again, there were very low expectations. The pejorative term was the pump. If I heard it once, I heard it a thousand times from our cardiologist. Well, he's going for a reoperation. You know, he's been on the pump before. So he must have had an incremental problem developed with the myocardium because of being on cardiopulmonary bypass. Imagine that pervasive opinion that every time you were on bypass, you got worse and worse and worse. Lots of adult cases, throw a few children in here and there. Itinerant everything. You did a child in the morning, you did a coronary bypass in the afternoon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, except cardiology. And there were very low expectations. My patient, who thankfully is still alive, Nicholas Burke, <coughs> was the first surviving hypoplast at Texas Children's in August of 1995. This is the truth. This is what happened. The expectations were low. It's uncomfortable, uncomfortable information. So to change the legacy, you gotta get the right people. It's always about the right people. You can have all the tools, all the bells and whistles. If you don't have the right people, you're not gonna get the job done. And we got the right people. We got a dream team. Hopefully you all know some of these folks. One of them is sitting right there, Richard Owens, and we've been colleagues now for longer than either of us want to admit. Richard leads our, our program in Austin now, but Deb, Marianne, Mary Claire, thousands of hours together and a lot of direct 
critique, quality improvement. One thing that really made them unhappy is for probably the first 500 cases we did, where I take the perfusion record, the anesthetic record, I would fax it to my colleagues in Melbourne and say, look at it, what do you think? How do you think we're doing? What can we do to do better? Didn't make a lot of friends doing that, I promise you. But that's what we had to do. And uh, we started having two perfusions uh, at the, at the, at the uh, field. That wasn't a popular uh, reality, but uh, it worked. And then of course uh, we had to invest a lot with the credit of Texas Children's. They didn't uh, resist <clears throat> the significant investment we need to make in machinery. With all due respect to Dr. Cooley, modify, simplify, and apply doesn't work on complex, detailed, small body perfusion. We needed the right tools, accurate tools, and a lot of gear. And we needed to be watching things really, really closely. So I pretty much live in the, uh, the ICU. I'm all about committed perfusion. Optimized outcomes require ser serious com uh, committed people. Optimized outcomes require continuous improvement. Optimized outcomes are not easy and they can be undermined by perverse incentives. So what does that mean? If there is an a disincentive to doing the best thing for the patient, there's gonna be a problem. And that includes itinerant personnel who do something and do something else and may have a conflict of interest with regard to patient commitment. And we can have administrative in, uh, intrusion. We can have an administrator somewhere that says, ah, you don't really need that. Why would you need that? Why would you need NEARS? What are the data that support the use of NEARS? And we have to re resist that. And then sometimes we're just out of resources. So how do we get accurate? Um, it's all about the details. And of course, I could be having this same lecture with aspiring pediatric cardiac surgeons. Cannulation, no big deal, right? No big deal, we cannulate all the time. We don't get it right all the time, ladies and gentlemen. We don't get it, and the smaller the baby, and by the way, for those of you here who are connected to industry, the technology cannulas have gotten worse and worse and worse. What I use today is infinitely worse than what I used when I started at Texas Children's in 1995. It's all about industry interest. So the principles, atraumatic, thoughtful, accurate, there are so many ways to mess it up. The smaller the baby, the more likely. Continuous troubleshooting, stay with it. Don't tolerate poor drainage. Don't tolerate poor drainage. You can't overcome it. Don't tolerate poor drainage. Don't beat up the heart. Don't smash on the heart. Sneak up on it is what I say. Whisper to the heart. Whisper that you're coming in. You don't know that I'm here. I'm not gonna beat you up. I'm gonna barely touch you. I'm gonna get the cannula in. You're not gonna know I'm here. You're not gonna know I went on bypass and I'm not gonna tell you when we're coming off. We're coming off with a whisper. So what are some of our core practices? You know, we could have an entire lecture on each one of these subjects. High hematocrit, short circuit, left side of the, uh, the pump on the left side of the patient. I'll show you why in a minute. pH stat, yes, anti-grade cerebral perfusion, rarely deep hypothermic circulatory arrest, pretty much only for total and almost pulmonary venous return, customized prime, no vacuum assist. Yes, crystalloid cardioplegia to this day, which we haven't changed in over 25 years. Did it yesterday, did it the day before intermittent crystalloid cardioplegia, high flow, low pressure, planned early ex excavation and continuous ultrafiltration. So can a surgeon mess up cannulation? Well, I did, I do. My colleague, Dr. Gottlieb, who will speak to you all in a little bit, um, published this quite a number of years ago. I got the cannula too deep in the arch and we had cerebral malperfusion. Now, if we'd not had NEARS, we'd have never known that, right? Now, was this clinically relevant? Not sure, but definitely we had a detriment in the nears because I stuck the cannula in too far. So 
we can all mess it up. So what can the surgeon do to optimize bypass? Again, accurate cannulation, minimize blood trauma, and that means not riding the suckers all the time, keeping the heart well decompressed, diligent preservation, plan in advance, discuss things in advance. If your surgeon colleague is not discussing the strategy of the operation extensively with you before an operation, your expectations are low. You will not achieve excellence. I don't know how many tens of thousands of operations I'm in my career now. I need to figure that out. But I need to review this with our team every single day. What is our plan and what are our expectations? And that is communication. So my, my view on my perfusion colleagues is just that they're professional colleagues, not subordinates. I'm very much, very much um, a difficult person when it comes to communication in the operating room. You know, look, we all wanna have a pleasant professional environment. We all wanna um, be able to do our very best work. But the operating room is sacred territory. It's not where we go to have fun. Um, my own son is about uh, halfway through his cardiothoracic residency at Hospital for University of Pennsylvania. And a year ago, more or less, he said he had done a case and it was fun. And I said, wait, 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 wait a minute here, my friend. Fun <coughs> for whom? Fun for whom? Please go talk to the patient and the family and ask how much fun coming to a cardiac operating room is as a patient. It ain't no fun. That doesn't mean we can't have a good decorum in the operating room, but I am very much a critic, uh, critic of having music in the operating room and communication in the operating uh, theater should be just like an air traffic controller. Pump on, pump on. Heparin, heparin, clamping the IVC, clamping the IVC. Unambiguous, clear, always with a readback. And what kinds of things that we need to know? I'm losing volume. We've got a marginal line pressure. You're riding those pump suckers, Dr. Fraser. We're, ha we're having hemolysis. The lactate is rising. The NEARS is not doing what we predicted. Where are we with hematocrit, electrolytes, calcium, warming, cooling? Did I remind you to warm? And again, sneaking on, sneaking off a bypass. We know as surgeons, any experienced surgeon knows when we go on bypass a little baby, if the prime is right, we know. We can see it in the heart. The color of the heart changes, the heart rate slows. So you're starting off, you do that, you know that you're starting the operation in a bad place. Maybe you'll climb out of it, maybe you won't. Personally, I believe that we have, because ECMO is so easily available that we tolerate poorer and poorer and poorer surgery. ECMO is a failure. Post-cardiotomy ECMO is a failure. Now, do I use it? I do. Do I like it? Not one bit. If I execute an operation and I have to come off on ECMO, I've probably not done something right either the assessment of the patient, the execution of the operation, something was not right. I will do just a little bit about the brain. Again, we could spend the whole, we could spend a whole week talking about cerebral protection or our perceptions of cerebral protection in children, but it mystifies me that we've gone from what was clearly the case when I started a black box and certainly Richard will remember that in the days when I was first getting started, I was looking over the ether screen a lot to just see what the color of the head looked like in the children. Biggest worry, huge worry. And now we have technology. <clears throat> um, we don't use this particular device anymore, the Somanetics device. We now use the Edwards device, but the point is, the debate about using near infrared spectroscopy to me is over, but uh, apparently it persists in some institutions. Now, for sure, those of us who have who quickly adopted um, anti-grade cerebral perfusion um, have used NEARS extensively to adjudicate cerebral blood flow 
and again, we could spend a lot of time on that, but <clears throat> it's very helpful in cases like this. So this was a baby, very small preterm baby, arch interruption, VSD, lot to do, lot to do. A lot of steric entrance, hard to see. Could we do this under circulatory arrest? Sure, but if we were, so bypass flow rates, nears, how would we know if we were in a period of circulatory arrest, how would we know how long the brain could tolerate it? How would we know in a given individual? How would we know? Well, in fact, we don't know. We don't know. You probably know that the number 40 minutes, more or less, of continuous circulatory arrest in children has been accepted. How do we know in a given individual what can be tolerated? Well, we don't if we don't have some form of physiologic monitoring. So how do we assess how we're doing? Well, that's what we do. We go to the bedside. So how many perfusions, don't raise your hands, but think, answer this for yourself. How many of you all are going by the intensive care unit and seeing your patients? How many of you are doing that every single day? How many go over there the day after surgery and look at the eyes, look at the liver, see how the urine output is. Oh, by the way, did the patient have seizures? How many of you are doing it? If you're not doing that, do it on Monday or tomorrow or tonight. Go see your patients. You can't know how you're doing. You're part of the management team. And so unless you're inter integrated into the care of the children, you won't know. You won't know how they're doing. Moreover, if you're not discussing it with your colleagues, so this, this is an older photograph, but it could have been yesterday. So just like my entire tenure at Texas Children's and for as long as they give me the good grace of working in Austin, we will meet every Friday morning at 6.15 and we will review, review every case that we've done the preceding week. And this is anesthesiology, critical care, perfusion, cardiology, we review every single case. And sometimes we're pretty brutal. We can be pretty brutal about it, but it's the way we improve continuously. And we're granular about our performance. So this is something we're very proud of in Austin. This is our program data sheet. I won't bore you with all the details, but we have a uh, ongoing basically report card, which goes through the entirety of the program and to anybody that wants it, quite frankly. And sometimes it's painful to look at how you're doing. So far, we seem to be doing okay. We have to look at it all the time. We, we seem to compare favorably to the current benchmarks, but if we don't, we have to look at it. Now, what else are we looking at? Uh, in the realm of hopefully refinement, <coughs> you all know that most patients with congenital heart disease have chronic illness. So there are very few things that we cure. So it occurred to me some time ago that transposition, we've gotten really good with the arterial switch operation. In fact, in my personal career, I'm well over 400 arterial switch operations. I've not had a mortality in this millennium, hundreds of arterial switch operations. Think about that. When I was a baby, everyone with transposition died. Everyone with transposition died. Dr. Cooley, others implemented the atrial switch, Jotini, the arterial switch. The mortality for the arterial switch at Texas Children's when I arrived here in 1995 was 25%. So we've come a long way, but we've not cured the disease. And so we got a whiteboard and said, what's life like for a patient with transposition? Well, we know a lot. And so we've started a journey mapping project for categories of disease, including single ventricle, AV canal, transposition of great arteries. So this is continuous assessment of how we've done. Now, obviously mortality is mortality. It's extremely uh, sobering and we have to focus on that. But we know that if we're not looking beyond mortality, we're not refining our expectation. And so this is what we're doing with transposition. Now, what about physiologic support? It's imperative. 
what the surgeon believes matters, what the anesthesiologist believes probably matters more, but what the perfusionist knows is paramount. Now, this is that field setup that I talked about. We, uh, Dr. Gottlieb, uh, coined the term the triangle of trust. We believe that there should be line of sight communication between the anesthesiologist, the surgeon, and the perfusionist. And the surgeon should be able to see exactly what's going on, as should the uh, perfusionist. And so we set the field up. Probably many of you all have the same setup where the surgeons wear a headlight camera, the perfusionist can see what's going on. Critically, critically important. Beyond the uh, OR, of course, we're all involved in extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which, by the way, was derived from cardiopulmonary bypass. I always bristle at the notion that someone says, well, we were on the pump too long. We were on the pump too long. And so we have to come off on ECMO to recover. Well, that's antithetical, isn't it? It's plastic tubing and a membrane oxygenator and a power source. Maybe less flow, maybe more flow, but doesn't make quite sense to me. We have a VAD dilemma in pediatrics. Um, don't see great hope on the near-term horizon, but we have to make really challenging decisions. Recovery, myocardial recovery, an important topic I'll share just with you, uh, with you in just a sec. And then we have this new transplant paradox and it's trouble. Trouble, we're seeing challenges with donor availability for our patients. Our patients seem to be waiting on the list extreme, extreme <clears throat> lengths of time. So we've had some pretty cool cases of late. This was a big two days at Dell Children's Hospital. And I uh, thought it would be fun for you all to hear about this. We didn't have a transplant program when we started on September 1st of 2018. We didn't have a VAD program when we started on September 1st, 2018. So we had to quickly implement that because the patients and families needed it. And this is one such, this is a single ventricle patient shunted. So systemic to pulmonary shunt whose heart fell apart and ended up on a Berlin heart for months. And unfortunately she developed a significant infection but fortunately her heart recovered. So we explained it. So she's still a shunted single ventricle having been explanted for a Berlin heart. That doesn't happen very often. That doesn't happen often at all. In fact, she's about ready to go home. And this one was really, really gratifying. So Koyana came to us. She was in persistent reentrant junctional tachycardia. She had a, an ejection fraction of about 8% when she presented to us. Um, we uh, supported her with a percutaneous transthoracic open chest LVAD, left atrium to ascending aorta, <coughs> centrifugal pump. She did not recover. Eight days, heart not recovering. We put a Berlin heart in her and listed her for transplant. And she waited and she waited and she waited and she waited. Five months in, she had a TIA. This, despite being on bival and very effectively cared for by our team, she had a TIA and we got scared. Um, so the notion was raised, she's, uh, has she recovered sufficiently to uh, be explanted? And you know, that's a big decision. That's a big decision, isn't it? Um, explanting and then re-implanting in a child, not so easy. In fact, doesn't usually work out. So this is at the time of the uh, Berlin implantation. Uh, this is on device. The device. Um, dance. You can't dance right now. Star every day. Of course, time. So we did a ramp study. Big 
special with the family. We so we'll complete our full scan now. We'll complete our full scan at 30 minutes. Then whenever our sonographer is done, we'll do our pump stop and another repeat echo 10 minutes after that. Yeah, so looking at the tricuspid valve and the pulmonary valve, we're going to be Dopplering. Encouraging. Yeah. That's why. It works. <laughs> Family, a lot of people. The subtle wall motion is still a little disconnect, but it's the stable compared to before. Oh, yeah. Is it yeah. catadocical? Yeah. yeah. It's right here. Dealing with that, uh, Apex is a bit of a challenge, not a wide. So she's home, and more importantly, thank you very much. That's what her heart's doing now, and uh, we're enormously pleased. And it is encouraging to think that this is now part of the, of the armamentarium that we can offer our patients more consistently. At Dell Children's, we have a bubble parade for long-term um, children that uh, finally get to go home. And so that was a great day for Quan and her family. Well, this is who we are. I mean, it's always great to come into the Texas Medical Center, which is incomparable um, anywhere, nothing like it in the world and uh, humbling to come back in a certain way. But uh, things are coming along in Austin quite well. Austin is uh, a very, very rapidly growing part of the world, very attractive place to be. This is our Dell Children's Hospital. We've just added another bed tower. Uh, we have a busy, busy cardiac program there, which didn't exist before. Uh, and the, the, other than the patients and the families, the most uh, gratifying part of that has been all the colleagues we've attracted there and get to work with who are working hard. So I love this. Good things come to those who wait. No. Good things come to those who work their asses off and never give up. So don't give up. So this is the UT and you know what's on the inscribed on the main building. If you don't, there it is. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So the truth is aspiration of excellence is not easy, but it's achievable. And uh, I wish you all well in your own pursuit of excellence. And Kathy, thank you. And Deb, thank you for this invitation. I really appreciate it.